Hello everyone, this is Phosphor G2021 and this is the Humahua Castro. Next, we will be having Paul Trat and Dustin. Uh, let me present you to them. And they will be presenting Evolving Image Visualization with Open Source Development. So you can, uh, I guess that you can start. Okay, thank you, Josie. Can you hear me okay? All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Trout. I am the Location 360 Imagery Lead for Bear Crop Science. Uh, today, I'll be joined by Dustin Sampson from Spark Geo. Together, we'll be presenting the evolving journey of uh, image visualization with open source technologies at Bear Crop Science. The Bear Group has science at its core. We focus on many ways uh, that science drives innovation and sustainability to help position Bayer as a leading uh, life science company. Uh, Bayer was founded in 1863. It's more than 150 years old. A work colleague uh, made this very nice timeline and I promised I would share, but I also feel like they buried the lead. Not everyone gets to say their company founded a soccer club in one of the top five soccer leagues in the world. Um, but Bear Crop Science is one of three divisions. Uh, pharmaceuticals and consumer health are the other two. Um, day to day, we're independent. We, we do periodically have, uh, we cross over and work with the other groups, but um, it's not normal. Uh, the company itself has uh, a presence in 83 countries around the world. Bear Crop Science is organized into four global regions that we see here. I work out of the, uh, the St. Louis headquarters for North America. Um, but we work with all four regions every day in our job with, with Location 360. Location 360, uh, is the team that I work on is part of the Global Data Assets Group. Um, as the name suggests, if there are coordinates or locational data involved, lo Location 360 will have a hand in the process. Uh, location 360 is organized by the three verticals that we see here. Um, as I mentioned, we're based in St. Louis. Our team is 100% remote, however, um, and we're bringing people on in, in different countries as well. We work almost entirely in the AWS cloud with Kubernetes and Argo-based workflows and CI/CD. We also work with the Google Cloud regularly. Um, our daily work involves satellite, UAV, and non-spatial lab imagery. Other teams in Location 360 work with IoT sensor data, macro and micro weather data, just to name a few. We manage more than 300 spatial layers and a GeoServer Postgres implementation. And in the spirit of open source here at FOS4G, uh, I have to say I've been with the team for almost eight years and have seen Location 360 grow from a four person ESRI centric team to 100% open source geospatial centric and a team of more than 70 people today. Open source has greatly contributed to our growth and allowed us to consistently drive value and improve performance. Later this morning, I have a second presentation uh, describing how our standardization on cloud optimized geotiffs or COGS uh, combined with the integration of spatial temporal assets catalog or, or the stack specification has provided an economy of scale to register, search, and access all spatial imagery for crop science for the crop science division. And this catalog-based workflow has really helped our team bring new and important business value. But today we'll be focusing on uh, the discovery, visualization, and interaction part of that workflow uh, that COG, COGS combined with Stacks has provided. Um, We've been on a multi-year partnership with Spark Geo to optimize our visual products for the internal bear application framework, uh, what we call Velocity. 
Um, this last project with Spark Geo has been um, an 18 month project where we've been standardizing on the stack model stack specification with COGS. Uh, but it really is the catalog centric view of this workflow that um, that has fueled this for us. And you'll hear Dustin refer to the, or you'll see his diagram show the Imagine API or the Imagine platform. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, Imagine API is synonymous with uh, imagery platform or the image catalog. Um, while we capture many types of imagery, uh, the content for what we're describing today is for GeoTIFFs only, which comes only from our satellite and UAS uh, pipelines. Our legacy process, um, which Spark Geo also helped us with, um, and we learned a lot from, it set the stage for what we have today. Um, but it was pre-rendered tiles uh, at many different scales for every image, um, and it would use Amazon uh, EMR, uh, and we had to pre-render every tile just in case somebody might look at it one day. Um, and so we really wanted to leverage what we learned from this implementation and evolve into something that was more performant, better search, had a standard process uh, that we could repeat for all types of imagery. And the guidelines that really drove this was uh, standardizing on the use of COGS for all of our GeoTIFFs. Uh, we swapped out pre uh, the pre-rendered tiles in favor of dynamic on-the-fly rendering, uh, which Spark Geo was very helpful in, in showing us how to implement that. Uh, we swapped EMR processing for Kubernetes with Argo workflows. And we, we have a search plugin that I'll show at the end after Dustin which uh, we've evolved from using CCAN-based catalog uh, for uh, you resource URLs to using the stack specification with TMS. And now I'd like to hand it over to Dustin. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I just want to do a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Dustin Sampson, and uh, obviously I work for Spark Geo. Um, if you're interested to find out more about Spark Geo, please uh, visit the website at uh, sparkgeo.com. And if you're looking for a change, uh, Spark Geo is a great place to work, as well as Bear. Um, but please check out our job website uh, if you're interested. So as, as Paul mentioned, um, he talked a little bit about the image catalog and what it is. Uh, but what I wanted to dig into uh, specifically is the global imagery pipeline. And this is a piece that we worked alongside the Bear Cop Science team in creating. Uh, here's an overview diagram of the Global Imagery Pipeline, which roughly represents the different services uh, and, and how the uh, direction of data flows within the pipeline. Uh, some of the goals of the pipeline was to uh, gather and store image metadata uh, in a stack catalog, uh, create cloud-optimized geospatial images, or COGS, but ultimately, uh, we wanted to make the images more discoverable and allow for uh, efficiencies in, uh, by other systems from fetching these uh, images. Uh, now I wanna talk through basically the different stages uh, of the global imagery pipeline. So starting at stage one, um, the global imagery pipeline uh, is fed images from existing data pipelines that are existed previously uh, to this pipeline. Um, existing data pipelines are represented uh, by this black box in the diagram. Um, these data pipelines can vary in shape and size. Some fetch images from third-party sources. Uh, they may be removing clouds from images or stitching drone imagery together. But one of the common, a um, couple common tasks that each of these pipelines do is one, they store the output of those images into an S3 bucket and also publish uh, a new image message uh, so that other systems are are aware that there's a new image uh, available. So the second stage uh, is a service that is listening for these new messages and uh, that are being produced by these existing data pipelines. Uh, each message uh, that the service uh, 
receives, uh, it'll create a stack item and then sends that stack item to imagine the Imagine API so that that item can be uh, added to one of the stack collections. Uh, for this project, we ended up creating uh, three custom stack extensions uh, that were needed by various parts of the pipeline um, to help with image processing, image rendering, and searchability. But I'll talk uh, about each of those three extensions uh, as they come up within the pipeline. So the first extension comes in here. Yeah, images are generated from the existing image pipelines and are stored in source image stack collections. Um, and these are identified by having this first stack extension. As the, uh, as the name suggests, uh, uh, source image stack collections uh, refer to the geospatial images that can potentially be processed by the Global Imagery Pipeline. So next, I wanna talk about what happens after the stack item uh, is added to the Imagine API. So when a new stack item is added by uh, the Imagine API, uh, a, a create item action message is published out by the API, allowing other systems to listen to these changes uh, that there's a new, that there's been a change to a stack collection or a stack item. Uh, other specific action messages that are important to the global imagery pipeline are um, item updates and item deletes as well. Okay, now that we know what's happening here after an item is added to the Imagine API, uh, now I want to go into the, onto the next stage. So the next stage in the pipeline is the global image service, which basically is listening for these uh, action messages that are published by the Imagine API. Uh, the service only cares about the action messages related specifically to source image collections. Um, so when one of these messages are detected by the service, the service will then query the Imagine API and f uh, to find any related product image collections. And from the attributes in the product image collection, the service is able to create uh, what we call an ingest uh, job definition. Uh, this job definition is then created uh, and then added to one of the processing uh, queues uh, to be later uh, processed by the ingest service. In the next slide, I'll talk about what a product image collection is and uh, talk a bit about the second stack extension we created. Uh, so product image collections uh, are collections of items related to images that I put in quotes derived from source images. Uh, we're not actually creating uh, an image on disk, but we are processing the image in order to, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. We're, we're uh, yeah, we're, we're, it's images that are, how the images are being rendered from source images, not an actual uh, product image on uh start on disk. So this type of collection also contains the second stack extension, uh, which helps identify a uh, collection as being a product image collection. And as well, it includes a, a tie back to the source image collection to basically help with a bit of the ancestry of, of, of you know, going from um, this product image was created from this particular source image. So maybe to help clarify this a bit, uh, an example of what this would look like. So a source image collection may contain a, a series of sentinel images and products that can be derived uh, from a sentinel images may be an RGB or an NDVI product. And then those would be stored in uh, the product image collection. Um, this a second extension also includes details uh, needed uh, to process the source image. Uh, things such as S3 uh, location where the image is stored. Um, the product algorithm to apply to the source image and the expected output uh, data type. Uh, the final uh, pipeline stage uh, is the ingest service. And this service has uh, five tasks. Uh, the first is obviously pulling the job definitions uh, from the queues, the different processing queues. Um, based on that job definition, the service will then fetch the source image from S3 and if the image isn't already a cloud-optimized GeoTIFF, it will convert it into one. So from that point, it needs to do some calculations. So first, it'll calculate a bounding box uh, of the product image. Um, the one thing different about a, uh, this bounding box, which we call an active footprint, is it uh, excludes any uh, no data values. Uh, so in some cases, the polygon will look like Swiss cheese. 
Um, uh, it also calculates statistics on this product image, um, standard deviations, histograms, uh, percentiles, that kind of information. And then uh, the last calculation will be generating a, a thumbnail of what the derived product image would look like. Uh, from here, the, the, this COG image, uh, new COG image is then uploaded to S3. And then uh, finally, um, a new uh, product image stack item is created and sent to the imagery pipeline so the, the item can be added to the appropriate product image collection. Uh, one thing to note here is that regardless of how many derived products that you create from a source image, um, there's only ever one COG image being stored in S3. So let's next talk about the last stack extension. Um, this last extension is used uh, with the product image items, uh, and it has two uses. Well, first, it's used by other systems to help refine image searches. And secondly, it stores the details on how the image should be rendered. So last but not least, um, the Global Image uh, Survey API. It's not really part of the Global Image Pipeline, but it's, it's part of the overall imagery uh, platform. And uh, so the way it works is, uh, a system or a user will make a request for a particular image tile. Uh, the product stack item is included on every uh, tile request. Uh, the server then fetches that particular product stack item from uh, Imagine. And then once it receives all those details on, on that particular image, uh, such as uh, like the product algorithm, um, it will then apply it to the source image, that algorithm to the source image. Uh, in the case of the NDVI, it, it'll know the bands it needs to do in the formula it needs to apply to it. Um, and also with the NDVI example, it will have a default color ramp to apply to that particular image. Um, and then lastly, uh, while rendering the tile, it uh, uses the statistics that are stored within the item to determine the min and max pixel value range. So whether it's using the min and max that were calculated earlier on, uh, the mean and standard deviation, histogram information, or even percentiles. Uh, so lastly, I just want to do a quick shout out uh, to some of the projects uh, that helped us create uh, the Global Imagery Pipeline. Um, I wanted to say thank you to all the people involved in creating and maintaining these projects. Um, this is a, a small list. Uh, obviously, we use a lot more uh, libraries and applications for this. Um, yeah, so I want to just turn that over back over to Paul. Okay, thank you very much, Dustin. Um, this is a, a different view for a non-technical audience of some of the things that, that Dustin just described. And the next part we'll be focusing on is the, the interplay between our the search tool, the global imagery search tool in the application uh, with the catalog and TMS. Um, this is another view of the same thing that, that Dustin just described. Um, our, our global imagery search tool is um, a plug-in for any of the JavaScript applications within the framework. Um, and we're able to search by sources or products. Um, and we have a time filter as well as the map itself acts as a spatial filter, which you can enable. Show me everything or just show me things that fit within the, the map frame. Notice here our count is 12,000 Sentinel uh, for a, a year within this map frame. Uh, when we change that from sources to products and we say, just show me RGB, now my number is uh, 6,100 because uh, it basically cut in half because the other 6,000 are NDVIs for Sentinel. Um, but these tiles that load in the search, um, you haven't added any of these to the map yet. These are just available to the user. And if you, the user needs more info, uh, we can right click and expose a, a link to go back into our general UI in front of our stack catalog of imagery. And you can see all of the metadata associated with that image, including some of the info that ties it back to the source that Dustin was describing. These are the assets that belong to, this is essentially an item in the stack catalog. And as far as the, I can zo now zoom, and Dustin mentioned Swiss cheese, this is that active data footprint. 
of, uh, of this image. And if I were to hover over another one, one of these other footprints would highlight to show me where it is. But when I zoom to that image, to that footprint, I can then click the, essentially this is a, a map control. We can have up to four different concurrent map controls. So you would see four different map squares in here. And I can choose which map control to send this image to. But this is uh, within the item in the stack catalog, this Swiss cheese uh, active data footprint that Dustin described, um, it's stored as a multi-polygon here in the item, which is available uh, through the, the catalog. And then just to, as I mentioned, to add the image to the map control, it's a, it's a simple click. And now what that actually does when we click that blue square to activate the, uh, the image that we've selected, it actually hits the TMS endpoint, which then does the range lookup to the image in S3. And what is pulling that we, uh, this is actually the product item in the stack catalog. It's just a URL template uh, for this resource um, that has our uh, rendering baked in to that resource uh, with the various extensions in the URL. So this, this asset, all it really is is this URL, um, which exposes it to, this, to a, a suite of applications through this search tool that Spark Geo has developed for us. Um, so the goal is business value and we really lean into machine learning but just this visualization that we've shown today has already provided some real business value for uh, our users regarding all of our imagery and R&D pipelines. Um, and I'd like to thank all the, these are the team members on both sides for Bear and Spark Geo um, that contributed to this effort. And that concludes our presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Paul, uh, Dustin, for your presentation. It was amazing. We have a few questions. Mm, so the first one is, how do you serve the stack data itself and how is that data store? Is it something like a post GIS backend on a stack server? Uh, for, for images, uh, we're, we're using uh, Rio Cog Tyler. Uh, to serve up images and it's pulling the images from uh, an S3 bucket. All right. The next one is, could you talk a bit more about the imaging server? Is that something you created yourself or an open source component? It was a, a legacy system um, that was one-to-one. -one, and if you notice, we had many assets. So. Um, we leveraged the uh, Staccato uh, Java server implementation of the SPAC, uh, stack specification, um, which has Elasticsearch on the back end. Um, and th that is our, our core, um, that's our core service. But then we rolled our own API in front of that uh, in Python um, to serve, uh, to connect to the stack uh, server uh, Staccato on the back end. But so the Imagine API is it's a, is a homegrown system. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. And we have time for another question. Uh, sorry, I meant the actual stack JSON stuff. Uh, I think this is related to the first question. But yeah. so maybe it's not a huge JSON file somewhere. It comes dynamically from something, I guess. Yeah. So we. Um, so our API um, that sit, we have a Python API that sits in front of the Staccato server, um, but it's it's the full it's just the stack specification um, that is returned uh, to any client that requests it. Um, we, we can access it via Postman. We can access it via uh, we have we built SDKs. We have a command line interface, um, and they all interact with that same uh, stack specification, which is that that JSON return. I, I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, we still have time for another question then. 
what products other than NDVI do you provide to, to users? So we also, we, we can, uh, we've had EVI in the past, a, a different type of index. Um, we do single band um, uh, crop height from, from LIDAR. We serve that up as well. Um, and we apply a color map to, to single band things like that. Um, so it's, it's any type of band calculation that can be performed on, on a single image at this time um, is what can be rendered. All right, thank you so much, Paul. And I think that's all the questions so far. So we will be finishing here. Thank you very much for coming to Phosphogy and for your talk. And we will be seeing you around. Yep. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Dustin. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. Bye-bye.